Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is. This is a really fun morning for me, i got to be honest with you. It sure beats working at Google or Facebook or LinkedIn with a bunch of guy engineers kind of hanging around. So uh, we should do this more often. But thank you all for being here. It's like standing room only or we have obstructive view seating, but just pretend you're at Fenway Park and the Red Sox are playing and you've got one of these old-fashioned poles in front of you. Uh, but this is really incredible. Um, you know, I, I want to give a huge shout out, thanks to our, our three doctors. Uh, Dr. Sandberg, Dr. Harris, and Dr. Weintraub for organizing this event and your incredible leadership. <laughs> M Michelle called me the leader of this organization, but you know, if you did an org chart, I would be somewhere on the third or fourth layer below in terms of impact. It's really this incredible team that we have surrounding us, whether it be board members or staff or our alumni and our kids that are really driving this organization forward. Uh, so I just wanted to share with you a little bit about the Boys and Girls Club to put the rest of the conversation that we're going to have today in context. So you have a sense of kind of who we are and so you don't leave here without just not knowing some of the basics. Um, and so Silicon Valley really is just a, ph a phenomenal place to grow up. You know, there's no place that I know I'd rather live with, with my wife and no place that we'd rather raise our three kids than right here. Um, you know, you hear about what's happening across the country, uh, some stagnation in certain places and challenges, but here it's all about growth and vibrancy and optimism and energy and all about the future. You know, this is really the most exciting place to live, uh, and it's amazing. And exactly as, as Michelle said, you know, our vision is that we want all the kids to grow up and have opportunities and grow up to live fulfilling lives where they can, you know, get a good education, get a fair paying job, get decent housing, and, and raise a family. And that's our vision for the future. Um, but unfortunately today, that's, that's not a real reality for too many students especially in the low-income neighborhoods, just a mile from here. I mean, we're talking about a very, very small community here that is unfortunately becoming more and more stratified. And so our goal at the Boys and Girls Club is to try to address that. And you know, if you look at some of the challenges facing some of the students just, a, a, like I said, a mile from here, you know, school is supposed to be the great, the great equalizer and the great opportunity. But unfortunately, 80% of the students in some of the low-income neighborhoods are below proficient in school. And as a result, over time, about a third of them are dropping out of high school. And even those that do graduate from high school don't necessarily have the skills required. And so they're unable to access all these great opportunities that we want our kids to access and to really be part of this vibrant Silicon Valley community. And if you think about the root cause there, certainly the achievement gap is a big deal, and school is a big deal. But we believe, in watching this and working with the schools and so on, that it's really the opportunity gap that precedes the achievement gap. And you have to really understand that in order to understand why the kids are struggling. And these are just some examples of some data I want to share with you, or some, some thoughts anyway. Um, you know, about half the parents of the students we serve didn't even graduate from high school. They love the kids just as much, they want just as much for their children, but they don't necessarily can't help them with their homework or not sure how to navigate the complicated school system. I know, you know, my wife and I just sent our first kid off to college and got another one who's a junior and another one who's an eighth grader, and like, we get confused. <laughs> you know, we were yesterday meeting at our private school with the head of school trying to figure out why she's struggling. Like, this is our kid who's got everything in the world, and you know, we have master's degrees and all this, and we're like not sure what to do. So I just can't imagine a kid sort of being out there with no parental, you know, no, with the parents not knowing how to, how to advocate for their child. Uh, and just and there's some real, real challenges day to day. About 43% of the students that we serve are homeless. Now, it doesn't mean they're on the streets, but it means that they are living very, very typically three families per house, sometimes four families per house. That's how they're afford, are able to live in this area with the incredible cost of living. Um, so that's, that's just the reality. That's not hyperbole or anything. I mean, that's just the reality. And so they don't even have a quiet place to do their homework or to study. Um, you know, and then there's the whole idea of social capital. And in some of these, of these families, have not graduated from high school, being immigrants, new to the area, don't have the social capital. And that's something I think that often gets overlooked or underemphasized of, of what it takes to be successful as a young adult is leveraging your social capital, leveraging your parents' social capital, understanding what it takes to become successful. And a lot of our students don't have the opportunity. And then lastly, I just mentioned, you know, the, the cost of living is just so high. We, we see countless high school students who aren't able to participate in our after-school programs or other things because they just need to work. You know, they have to just bring home money to help pay for rent. And that's just tough. You know, it's the whole idea of what works for most of our kids today, you take that free internship, you know, over the summer, you get extra tutors, like you invest now so you reap the benefits later. 
which is a great business model, so to speak, for <laughs> raising a kid. But when you have to start, you, know, you can't afford to invest. It just makes it harder. So that's sort of the context of where we are. Um, but let's talk about the solution, uh, because I think at the Boys and Girls Clubs, it's really inspiring and, and seeing great, great things happen. First of all, what we provide the Boys and Girls Clubs is a sense of belonging. These are our members. They join the Boys and Girls Clubs. We all need to belong to something. We need that sense of camaraderie, whether you're part of the Peninsula Ball, whether you're part of a football team, whether hopefully yours didn't, but my son just joined a fraternity. Not very, my, <laughs> Betty's very unhappy about that. Uh, I'm a little bit unhappy, too. Um, but it's that human need to belong to something, right, that we all have that's so important. And let's make it a positive. Let's make it a positive identity. And that's what they get the Boys and Girls Club, to be part of something positive. And then they get that thing that's most important, that relationship with that caring, loving adult. That's what it's all about, that mentorship. Many of you in here are volunteers, are mentors with our students. Love to have more of you come and mentor the student, but it's that one-on-one -on -one time that you show where somebody cares about you and believes in you. A chance to do extracurricular activities that all of our kids do after school, whether it's art, or whether it's being a sports team, or maybe it's a chance to learn about te technology, um, or maybe it's just a chance to learn about healthy eating and healthy food. And then it's just a chance to have fun. You know, a chance just to be a kid. Too many of our students are growing up in very stressful situations. There's really, there's very high anxiety uh, in the terms of living situations. And a place where they can come after school and just be a kid for an hour or two is really, it can't be underestimated how important that is for long-term growth and just long-term success as a person. So that's sort of the tradition of the Boys and Girls Club, that safety, belonging, and fun. But we recognized about five or 10 years ago that that's no longer sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. In order to be successful and be able to come, to find it as economically self-sufficient, our students need more than just a high school diploma. They need at least two years of post-secondary training. They need to either get a college degree, an AA degree, it could be a nursing degree, it could be a plumber union, it could be joining the army. There's different ways, different paths they can take, but they can't just stop in high school. Those jobs don't exist anymore. They used to exist, but they don't exist anymore. So they have to do well in school. That's not a, that's not a, a choice, it's just a mandatory. So we've really emphasized much more around our, our academic support. And we help our kids with homework. Uh, certainly, um, we also help them with tutoring, provide tutoring. Um, and we also, this year, have done a much deeper dive around school success and academic support, focusing on literacy for the elementary school students. So a real emphasis there. Um, all the research talks about third grade reading levels being critical. So we're doubling down on second and third graders, providing additional resources for them, hiring additional full-time staff to work with them in their schools to support their literacy. Uh, we provide more personalized learning instruction. What you see here is a picture of small group instruction, where we group the students based on where they are academically and then provide tailored instruction for them. Uh, so that's really part of, a core part of our vision around the, uh, around the academic success. Uh, at the same time, we're also doing a lot of social emotional learning, the SEL services as well, because academics alone isn't what they need to succeed in school. It's really a, a both ways we're coming at it. Um, but it's very different from the typical Boys and Girls Clubs. And we call it BGCP 3.0. It's a different model uh, than what most students have, most Boys and Girls Clubs have, and it's required us to hire specific staff who are expert in this area. And our strategy is to partner really closely with the schools. So currently, 80% of our students are actually served on school campuses. The clubhouse model that you kind of think about is still important. It's still the foundation. But that represents only 20% of our students. 80% are on the school campus. And if you talk to the principal at Bellhaven School or Bentwood or Hoover School, she'll say that her school goes from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Because the, school, the kids just stay there from when the school day ends until the afternoon, and they get three more hours of additional learning time. It's not three more hours of school, three more hours of learning time. A subtle difference, but important, it's important that it changes for them a little bit. For the kids, it can't feel like more school, but there's still more learning. We use the same curriculum the school is using. Uh, we're now sharing data with the schools. Um, our staff support the schools and the teachers during the day. So we've gone from being a sort of a nice addition to the schools to now being an integrated core of what we do, of what other schools do. And we're currently at five school sites in Ravenswood and Redwood City. We're at four in the high school district, Sequoia Union High School District. Uh, we just met earlier uh, or last week with the superintendent of Redwood City School District. He asked us to be at all of his schools. 
And he said, this is actually kind of funny, he said that his principals are actually complaining to him. The principals who don't have our after-school program are complaining to him, saying, why don't we have this, the Boys and Girls Clubs program? Our students need that, too. So we'd love to make that happen. Um, that's just a, an issue of funding. Um, the, the favorite thing that we do, actually my favorite thing that we do, is our summer program. Uh, and it's just incredible, because obviously summer learning loss is a huge deal. In fact, some research has indicated that over half the achievement gap can be attributed just to summer learning loss alone. I know that my kids are doing amazing summer programs. I'm sure yours are as well. Uh, but a lot of our kids, without the Boys and Girls Clubs, are basically going to be hanging out uh, at home and not doing anything. I mean, these programs are crazy expensive. So what we're able to do is not only do a, stand, not only do a summer program ourselves, but integrate deeply with the schools. So we run the summer school program in partnership with Redwood City and Ravenswood. The kids get three hours of core academic instruction in the morning from certified teachers, whether it's math and literacy and science. Uh, and then what's so incredible about that is not only do they have a certified teacher, but they get our staff as well, who's typically community college student or alumni. And then we have these incredible high school volunteers who come. And I don't know if any of your kids here have been high school volunteers. I know there are a couple. I saw Sarah. I know at least, OK, we have, we have a bunch. And we have these high school volunteers who come. And our students end up getting a ratio of 5 to 1. So they have this very intense small group instruction uh, really tailored to where they are. Uh, and then these shirts are. Our data shows that 90% of them avoids, actually 94%, avoid summer learning loss. 80% of them make summer gains. So it's really a phenomenal example of how we're supporting our kids, uh, their academic needs. In addition, how many of your um, kids here have done Camp Galileo, Camp G? Can I see a share of hands? I'd be surprised that every hand goes up. Uh, all three of my kids camp, did Camp G. And the first time my kids went there, I was like, this is amazing. We have to do Camp G at the Boys and Girls Clubs. We have to get it there. So we have a partnership with them now where they teach our staff and provide the curriculum. And we run Camp Galileo for our students on our campus in the afternoons, learning about enrichment and the innovator's mindset. So that's a summer program. Uh, it's just phenomenally successful. Um, and as a result of the summer program and the after school program, our kids are getting an extra uh, 700 hours of learning time a year, which is a 60% increase over what they get during the school day alone. So that's how we're really making a huge difference on our kids uh, educationally. Our staff is what makes all this possible. I do, I do like to brag about the quality of the staff that we've been able to attract at the Boys and Girls Clubs. I joke that I'd rather be here than at Facebook or Google. Uh, and the reason is because I get to work with the same kind of people, uh, but on a more fun mission. And something that I care about. And we've been able to attract folks uh, to work with us who uh, could be working anywhere they wanted to. They could be in your chairs. Uh, they could be at the staff. And they're just, they really are bringing a very uh, aggressive mindset to this problem. This is a super challenging problem. We're making lots of mistakes. We've done lots of things not so well. Um, but they're hungry to do it better. They're ambitious. And we want to do better. And we're going to continue to try to um, meet the needs of our, of our students. Now, the real secret sauce of our staff, though, is the alumni that we have working for us. You're going to meet two of our alumni today. They actually don't work for us. They're off doing other great things. But we have a lot of our alumni who stay at the Boys and Girls Subs. Um, these three are actually in community college right now. So while they're in college, well, actually they're not in community college, they're in regular college. Um, but while they're in college, they come work for us in the afternoons. And that's really that Boys and Girls Club secret sauce. That's when things are going the best. When you start with the younger kids, and then you have the alumni coming back and teaching them, they can tell you know, they're the best role models, they're the best mentors that we could possibly have. Um, so in terms of locations, uh, we have 12 sites I mentioned. We're in East Palo Alto, Eastern Menlo Park, and Redwood City. So we serve three school districts, Ravenswood, Redwood City, and the Sequoia Union High School District. Uh, we have 2,500 students in grades K through 12, that come an average of four days a week. So as far as I know, it's a pretty unique breadth and depth of an organization uh, in terms of what we're serving. Um, you know, the only organization as well that does school year as well as summer, and super importantly, we serve all kids. We welcome all kids. There are a lot of youth development organizations out there, especially college access programs, that are selective about whom they serve. You have to apply to get in. And, and those are amazing, amazing programs. Um, but there needs to be someone out there who's going to serve all students, and where all students are welcome. And that's the role that the Boys and Girls Clubs fills. So oh, let me also mention our, um, 
our high school programs. So we've also invested quite a bit recently in our college access programs. We now have 250 students involved in either college or in our college access programs. So that's been growing like gangbusters. Um, we need mentors to help with our students. But uh, it's, it's really been phenomenal to see, uh, see these kids working and, and striving and now succeeding uh, in, in getting into two-year colleges or often four-year colleges as well. So Michelle mentioned as well that we're one community. And I want to emphasize that, um, you know, how small our geography is, right, between here and Los Altos, Portola Valley and Woodside and Atherton and Palo Alto. Um, you know, the students that we serve are located in the low-income neighborhoods, right? Those are, those are pretty clear. Do any kind of demographic analysis between um, San, San Francisco and San Jose. These are really the, the two or three low-income neighborhoods that exist. And that's where the students live. But what's interesting is to think about, and you can just say, well, that's, that's that community, right? But think about where the parents work. These are where the parents work. This is one community. We are all in this together. We are all interdependent, right? We're all dependent upon each other. So think about it as one. And then I want to share this with you. Um, this is last Friday. Uh, I was actually, last Friday was a, um, it was a school holiday for Veterans Day. And most kids are off hanging out, going to the beach, doing whatever. These are five of our Redwood City students who were at Menlo College, thanks to Terry, um, working uh, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., thinking about the college essays and the use of the year speeches and what they wanted to do with their lives. And I just stopped by kind of in a lark at 3.30 on Friday afternoon and wasn't really sure what to expect. It's a completely unscripted moment and everything. And they said that they were talking about how much they didn't want to wake up at 8 o'clock, how resentful they were about having to wake up at 8 o'clock. But now at 3.30, how happy they were to have had this experience to be together and talk. And I asked them, like, what were you guys talking about? And they said, well, we're talking about how much we have in common. And I said, oh, so you know, what do you have in common? And then they all took turns talking about it. Um, but the first thing they said, and this is actually Des right there on the second one from the, uh, the right. If you haven't met Des, by the way, you really should meet Des because he may be the next president. Um, Des goes, we all come from struggle. And it was just really powerful the way he said that. He said, we all come from struggle. They talk about the hardships they've had growing up. He said, but the Boys and Girls Clubs was a lifeline. And each of them gave a story. And I'm not going to go into the stories here. Um, but let's just say it blew me away, and I've been here for 15 years. Uh, I had no idea what they had gone through. But they said that they didn't have direction, and the Boys and Girls Club had shown them a way, and that it was a lifeline, and that because of this, they were looking to go to college, and they had asked goals and aspirations, and they kept saying that over and over again, how they had learned goals and aspirations. And just hit me that moment really in the gut about what the Boys and Girls Clubs is about. And not all of our kids are coming from situations of significant struggle, but a lot are. It's a very hard time to grow up around here in these kind of circumstances. But what the most thing that hit me the most was that they weren't saying it with pity. They were just saying it with pure matter-of-factness, like this is just their life. In fact, their, um, the instructor, Denzel, had coached them, and one of the Menlo teachers, professors, had coached them to say, you know, you, you say you wanted your dad in your life, but you recognize if your dad had actually been in your life, things would have been different. And you don't know what they would have been, and you wouldn't be where you are right now, and you wouldn't be who you are right now. And they took that philosophical view, and it's like, you know, I'm happy where I am right now. I'm happy with who I am right now. I'm just going to focus on going forward. And there was no anger. I mean, obviously, I won't, you know, white brush it, whitewash it and say it. But, you know, they weren't there with anger and resentment. They were just there. This is my, these are the challenges I faced. These are the struggles I faced. And they had this hunger. It's optimism to do better. And that's really the essence of what these kids are um, that we serve. You know, they, they may come from struggle, but they want to do better. These, all these, the, the two students that I heard specifically speak, but they were in a really dark place when they came to the club. They were really needy. And the only path they could see was a path, in Des's case, of his older brother who was robbing houses and was now, was now in jail. It was the only path he saw. But he came to the club because he wanted a light. He wanted someone to show him a light, a way to go. And we don't do anything for our kids. We don't, this is not a charity at the Boys and Girls Clubs. This is about providing a light to a different path. This is showing them, hey, you know, you can actually go here instead of there. You don't have to go there. Here's another way. You can go to college. You can 
do another thing with your career, and we're going to help you by providing you with opportunity, and we're going to be there to guide you, just like I guide my own three children, but not do it for you. And just that sense of empowerment was uh, incredibly powerful. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and the last thing I want to share with you, as you uh, hopefully think about getting more involved um, in the Boys and Girls Clubs, is, uh, is, time, is your, time is our scarcest resource. And the most important thing any, any of us make in our lives is what do we do with our time? And I've been incredibly fortunate over the last 15 years to have the opportunity to work at the Boys and Girls Clubs, to use my time to provide opportunities for the low-income students in our neighborhood, in our community. And it's been incredibly rewarding. And I'm just deeply, deeply appreciative of that. And none of us know how much more time we have. None of us know what the future holds. Um, but I guarantee you that if you get involved with an organization like the Boys and Girls Clubs and get involved with these kids and work to help others, I guarantee you, you will, you'll never regret it. And helping others is certainly the straightest path to a more fulfilling life. So I urge you to really get involved, join Team BGCP, and together in partnership with our shared values, let's make our community a great place for all kids to grow up. So thank you. That's funny. Good morning. Um, you can see that uh, I've always had a flair for fashion. <laughs> um, and you can also see that I felt really stifled by the school uniform. <laughs> so I can understand my kids' chagrin when I'm like, pull that skirt down, because they're at Castileo. Um, so this is incredible. I, I'm just overwhelmed by the women in this room. And thank you all for joining us. So you see this here, this is the island of Jamaica. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I, don't, I know so many of you, and yet I bet you some of you didn't even know I was an immigrant, but um, all immigrants come to the United States with a dream. And when my parents came to America, my mother was consumed by this, right? She was gonna like, how do you make your kid American? Like, how do you make them successful? Like, um, you know, what do you do? And like all good mothers, she decided that she was gonna feed us into being American. And so she heard about, like, you know, the American breakfast and the breakfast of champion. And so she decided that that's what we were going to have. And so every morning she would get up and she would boil the milk because we're Jamaican. You can't actually feed your kid something cold. And I know there's another Jamaican in the audience, and that is just not going to happen. You can't feed yourself something cold for breakfast, your kid. So she would boil the milk, and then she would painstakingly, like, you know, pour the cereal and set the table. And then she would go and wake us up. And then we would get ready, and about 20 minutes later, we would sit for a breakfast of warm milk and soggy, disgusting cereal. And we thought, oh my gosh, America sucks. And, um, you know, poor American children, like, this is really torture. And so for years, like, my sister and I were like, gosh, this is just, I mean, we hated breakfast. I still hate breakfast. Um, and it wasn't until years later that we had a sleepover with some American cousins who were like, what the hell is this? Like, <laughs> this is not how you eat cereal. Um, but as you can imagine, I still have flashbacks to like cornflakes and all the rest of it. So in any case, I came to the United States um, as a grammar school kid, not much younger than my children are today, 11 and 13, and I have two girls, many of you know them. Um, and like most immigrant children, our move to America was motivated by our parents, right? And their dreams. Um, their dream for more, but most importantly, their dream that their children would have the opportunity to dream for themselves. And that's really what motivated, motivated them. When my parents immigrated from Jamaica, they were leaving a country um, where it, it was fraught with political uncertainty and fearfully close to communist Cuba. This was sort of the early 80s, late 70s. Um, and as a child, when I asked my father, you know, why did you leave Jamaica? Like, why did you come to America? Um, you know, he would say, because you were girl children, because I had girl children. And again, if there are any Caribbean people in the audience, you know that they speak in these parables and you're sort of like, oh, what the hell? So 
you know, he said, like, you, you were girl children. And I sort of had no concept what he meant. And it took becoming an adult, um, going to the very male Dartmouth, um, going to the very male medical school, and Stanford was better than most, um, and then choosing a very male subspecialty and practicing in neurosurgery to understand what he meant by the additional challenges of being a girl child. And in reality, my father was absolutely right. Um, Jamaica has yet to graduate a female neurosurgeon. Um, and yet, here I stand, a female neurosurgeon. So, dream fulfilled. Um, and I think... I think each of us here today, whether we have children or not, um, you know, we held a dream for our, for our children and for the children of our families and the children of our communities. Um, we all know that dreams are difficult enough to accomplish, right? That's why we call them dreams, right? Because they're kind of out there. Um, but they are becoming more and more challenging and impossible given the current political and social climate that we are in and the attack on women, okay? All you have to do is turn on the television and turn on the radio. Nonetheless, many of us in this room, in fact, I would say all of us in this room today are examples of what it is to have a dream fulfilled. And so we thank you for taking the time to come out today and join us to honor and to foster the dreams of the kids in our lives, the kids in our communities. This is huge, and we are so grateful that you've, you, you're joining us on this mission. Additionally, I'm going to ask you to take a moment now to welcome to the stage two of the most amazing women of the community who have benefited and partnered with BGCP in fulfilling their dreams. And they're going to spend some time to you today answering some questions in a panel format. So let's give a round of applause to Nancy and Lindsay, who are going to come up and join us. Lindsay is an alumni of the East Palo Alto Clubhouse. Uh, she came to BGCP for about seven years, and she attended Howard University, historically black college, which is just amazing, um, and graduated, get this, summa cum laude, with a BS. with a bachelor's in edu elementary education, and she is now paying it forward and teaching second and third grade math at Center City Public Charter School in Washington, DC, and came out to join us today. <laughs> And not to be outdone, Nancy is an alumna of the Redwood City Clubhouse, and she attended the amazing Santa Clara University on a full scholarship, okay? Yes. Nancy epitomizes our theme today, as Nancy is also a dreamer, all right? And she is now working as an immigration counselor at Catholic Charities in Santa Clara County. <laughs> so, okay, I'm so excited that they're here. I can't believe you guys traveled so far. We barely made it here from Los Altos Hills. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. So I just want to ask you guys, you know, this whole theme is about dreaming and dreams of our communities and our kids and stuff. Tell me a little bit about your dreams um, growing up and, and what challenges you faced in trying to accomplish them. Nancy, why don't you okay. go Okay. Uh, so my parents immigrated or my parents and I immigrated to this country when I was 11 months old. So uh, they left everything behind uh, in, their, in Mexico. And uh, we had to start from zero here, right? So my mom uh, cleans houses and my dad works in construction. And when they came to this country, it was a very difficult decision uh, because they left uh, their comfort zone, they left their families. Um, and, but it was because they wanted to give me, uh, at the time, uh, and then my siblings, a better future and the opportunities that they didn't have in Mexico because they weren't able to finish high school. Uh, they had to start working uh, at a very young age in order to be able to support their families. And so uh, when we came to this country, they had this vision and this dream uh, for my siblings and I to be able to graduate from high school, but also a, attend college and have a career so that we could be self-sufficient, independent um, women. And so my dream growing up was to 
one, make my parents' sacrifices not be in vain, but at the same time, uh, I wanted to be able to take care of them because they had given up so much and, and sacrificed so much for me to have this opportunity that, that they didn't have. So I would, when I would go and clean houses with my mom, uh, at a very young age, I sort of envisioned me being able to give my parents uh, a house like the very beautiful homes, like like the ones that we were cleaning. Um, so I, that was my dream growing up. Thank you. How about you, Lindsay? I know your mom's in the audience. She is. Um, I would say that I didn't really have a dream. Um, I didn't know that I was supposed to have a dream. It's not that there weren't things that I wanted to do, they just weren't important. And I didn't see people, like I'm the first in my family to go to college, excuse me, go to college and graduate. So I didn't see, I didn't have a vision of excellence. I didn't have like a role model that I saw do these things. So I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to follow in their footsteps. Um, so I didn't have a dream until junior year in high school. So I finally got my life together. Um, and I was at the Boys and Girls Club and my mentor, Sean Mendy, was helping run the college bound program. And I walked up to him one day and he told me, not asked me, he told me that I was going <laughs> on a college tour to San Diego. And this was my first and last uh, college tour. But it was really exciting because I hadn't really been out of this small little bubble um, here. And so to be able to go to San Diego and tour some of the schools was really nice to actually be there and envision myself like at the school. And I really fell in love with San Diego State. And I just knew that that's where I was going to go. And be, I knew that. And I finally had the dream. I can envision myself doing it and actually being there and getting a college degree because of the relationships that I formed at the Boys and Girls Club and the programs that I was in. So you got your life together in high school. Yes. How many in the audience have their life together? <laughs> <laughs> so we're pretty excited about that. Um, so tell me a little bit about the role that the Boys and Girls Club played in your lives. Either of us. Yeah, you were a member for seven years. Yes. And you were a member for 11 years. Correct. So right. I joined the Boys and Girls Clubs when I was six years old. And I initially started playing sports there, but I eventually transitioned into enrolling in academic programs. And eventually I became an active member in the leadership clubs that the clubhouse has to offer. Um, I also benefited from tutors and uh, I developed uh, very meaningful relationships with the staff. Uh, I gained mentors, one of them who is actually in the audience today. And she, I met her here at this very, uh, at this very place, at the circus club, my junior year in high school. And she was, she played such an important role in helping me apply uh, to college and also helping me apply for scholarships uh, because I'm an undocumented, I was an undocumented student at the time, or I'm still undocumented. And so I didn't have access to financial aid. So Tracy created this binder, Tracy Kuhn, who is my mentor, mm -hmm. created this binder for me uh, with all the scholarships that I was eligible to apply for so that I could finance my college education. So. Uh, Boys and Girls Club helped me in many aspects of my life, uh, not just on during the throughout the academic piece of it. Uh, she has she is now a friend uh, that I have incredible and memorable conversations with, um, and I still spend a lot of time with her because she has served as a great example and role model for me. Uh, and the time that we've spent together has made me realize that I I can make, I can make my dreams come true and I can achieve what I, what it is that I set my mind to. Uh, but I also have to create, she's helped me create a plan to make those dreams uh, a reality. Great, great thank you. Um, let me ask you, so you went all the way to DC for yes. school, freezing cold. Um, what, like, tell us a little bit about your transition to college and what, um, what, like, what did you take with you from the Boys and Girls Club that you think might have helped in your success? Mm -hmm. um, so originally I said that I wanted to go to San Diego State and I was a gung-ho on San Diego State. Um, but I was also choosing between San Diego State and Howard University. Um, Howard University is an HBCU, which is an historically black college or university. And um, my mentor, Sean, who I met through the Boys and Girls Club, knew somebody who was in the grad program at Stanford, who I went to Spelman College, which is an HBCU in Atlanta, Georgia. And so I linked up with her, and we had just a short 30-minute lunch. Um, her name was Nikki Jordan. 
And she told me about her experiences at, in college and being a black woman and being surrounded by women that look like her from different, different backgrounds, had different experiences, and they were all just successful or they were all trying to achieve success and push themselves to their highest potential. And she kept telling me about these stories. I'm like, wow, like I, I can see myself doing that. And she was my first vision of somebody who went to college and had actually went through the motions and came out on top. And so I could see myself doing the same thing. And so it's only 30 minutes, but she convinced me. And after that, I was like, OK, San Diego State is it is a nice school. But I think the school that will actually allow me to fulfill my dreams will be Howard University. And so um, that's how I ended up in freezing D.C. Um, yeah. Um, so what dreams remain for you guys? Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I've been very fortunate because I, as you mentioned earlier, I work as an immigration counselor, so I'm working uh, with a community that I feel really passionate about, but in order to be able to, I guess, finalize that dream, um, my hope is to go to law school and be an immigration attorney, uh, because that will enable me to help more people. Um, in, in the same field that I'm currently working on. And it would also hopefully give me the financial stability to be able to take care of my parents um, because that's, that's always been very important to me. And this last question is for both of you guys. Um, so we've got about 300 of the most amazing women in Silicon Valley sitting here today. First of all, thank you guys for coming out. Um, and these are, you know, awesome people because they know Dana, Michelle, and myself. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but no, so as you reflect on your time in BGCP and growing up, um, if, you, if you could look back on when you were at the clubs, what, what could we have done for you and what can we do for the next generation of you? Um, kind of, it's kind of like a three-part answer. Um, <laughs> definitely allowing young women and all students at the Boys and Girls Club, like give, providing them with experiences and exposures to different career paths. Um, as I mentioned before, I didn't see people in my life like being computer engineers or into music or into art. Um, and so going to the Boys and Girls Club and actually like seeing people in my community and then people that were visitors and volunteers come in and just give us a glimpse of their life. So just volunteering, even if it's just 30 minutes, if it's like 30 minutes of homework tutoring that you can do. I met with Nikki Jordan for 30 minutes, and she's the one who convinced me to go to, to Howard. Um, so even if it's 30 minutes and that's all that you can give, like just show up and be present. Um, and then secondly, just being very intentional with the language that you use when you're speaking to um, young girls and ensuring that it's, in, uh, it's empowering. Um, I was telling Nancy yesterday, actually, that um, I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, and so I actually stopped my second grade lesson the other day um, because one of my boys was talking about girl push-ups. And I was like, oh, actually, no, you don't mean girl push-ups, you mean modified push-ups. And then he's showing me the push -up. I'm like, no, it's still a modified push-up. <laughs> um, and so my girls are also like, yeah, that's a girl push-up. And at this point, I really took a moment to just disrupt what they believed about what a girl is. Because if you allow students to think that there's a difference between a push-up and a girl push-up, then you're allowing them to think that being a female is inferior. And so when they grow up and they get some position at um, a tech company and they're at an executive board meeting, they're thinking that what they're about to say, no one's going to listen to because, oh, I'm a woman in a room full of men. And so my thought is going to be inferior to what they're thinking. So just being very intentional with how you speak to them and being up lifting and being empowering and you can never you can never be too empowering um, and <laughs> And me and Nancy both agree that there is, although there are many um, organizations that do things to uplift and empower women, we know of one that is, um, we have personal experience with one that definitely allowed us to have exposure and experiences with successful women from a variety of different backgrounds and also very intentional with um, how they speak to us and how we develop interpersonal relationships with our mentors there. And it's the Boys and Girls Club and you, have already given us two hours of your time, and it's a phenomenal start. <laughs> um, and we would just hope that we'd be able to see all of your faces there as well. 
I think with a room with this full with, filled with these many women, um, it just goes to show that there's so much potential for every person here to be a leader and to be a good role model, a positive role model for the girls like Lindsay and I in, at Boys and Girls Club. So like Lindsay said, two hours of your time here is a great start, but imagine how much further the time that you spend out with a child um, in, in our clubhouse can go. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Tracy has been such an important role model in my life. and. Uh, you can be that same mentor or role model for another girl. Um, and if that is too much of a commitment, you can always um, find an event that you can volunteer at um, and spend a little bit of time doing that because we're all busy, right? We all have, a, you might have kids, you might have a job, a career uh, that you are focused on, but the, the kids at the club, the kids like us at these clubhouses uh, could benefit from seeing more women in positions of, of leadership. Thank you so, so much. As you can see, they're absolutely amazing. Please let's thank just you. thank them once again for joining us.